So, do you remember what we did last time? How did you go? Okay. Do you or? It's a blank. You were tired. Do you remember what we did last time? Okay, let me just briefly review for you. So, we, we talked about this uh, D'Alembert principle. You remember the name at least, right? Uh, and essentially, he said that uh, if you take this quantity, where well, these are the, the, the forces, right, minus the, the, the dot, the time derivative of, the, of your momenta. So this essentially is what? It's, it's just Newton's law, right? Because it's just F minus MA that I've written here. So that is zero. A y is zero. It is zero if your body is moving accordingly to, to Newton's law. And if you take this is a vector quantity, so you 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 dot this vector quantity into these displacements that I remember. You remember I, I call them virtual displacements because where displacements <coughs> of your system according to the constraint. As, f as they are frozen at the initial time. So you don't let the, fr the constraint move. So this quantity was 0, OK? So as I said, I wrote 0 equal to 0 in a fancy way. But of course, there is a reason. Because then, through a series of manipulations here, essentially, I went from Cartesian coordinates that are indicated by R to those coordinates that I call generalized coordinates, right? These Qs that are scalar quantities. And if you, if you do that, I'm not going to, to rederive this because I did it uh, 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 last time, you get this set of equations that is essentially this. So let me write. So you do that. And now you sum over j. This quantity that I write, uh, so you sum everything that is inside the curly brackets in here. And you had this nice quantity so curly bracket and everything here is multiplied by well it's not a scalar product uh, because these are scalar quantity so the virtual displacements as written in terms of this generalized coordinate and this is equal to zero so here is where we stop okay so let's start again from here this I call the, this quantity Q sub J, I call them the generalized forces because they were related, right, to, to the forces here through this change of variable to independent uh, generalized coordinates. And this T here is just, uh, what, just the kinetic energy of your, uh, of your set of, uh, of your body, or, you know, of your system. And notice here is Q dot, and here is Q without the dot. Okay, so here are generalized velocities, and here are generalized coordinates. So what can I do? Uh, first of all, by assumption, the generalized coordinates are all independent, right? I, I pick my coordinates in such a way that they are independent, so that I can vary them independently from uh, one another. So that means that uh, this uh, sum is the sum of this times this, and these are all independent. So to, for this to be 0, for this quantity to be 0, the quantity within the curly brackets must be 0, right? Because you are multiplied many pieces, but each piece is multiplied by something that is independently, that you can vary independently from everything else. So for this to be 0, this must be 0. So here I have these equations that you see start looking what I wrote down the first day or the second day, uh, and I call the Lagrangian uh, quantities. But as you notice uh, uh, last time, uh, still something is missing because here I have these generalized forces, and what I really want is the potentials, right? Because that's a nice thing. Because the pot you see here, I still have a, a force in a way, so still some vectorial like quantity, even though it has been written in terms of a scalar quantity qj. But I want to go to the potential, and that I can always do if, so first step is that uh, I can replace this by this. So 
So I don't have one equation. I have, as you know, this J runs through the degrees of freedom of your system. So if my system has uh, five degrees of freedom, I, I have five of these equations, one for each. So that's good, right? Because I have five unknowns, the, the degrees of freedom, and, and I have five equations. So in general, I'll be able to solve my problem. So the, the, the next step, the one we, we take today, is that I assume that these forces, really these were, were, you see, the external forces, right? These forces, then, I assume that they can be derived from a scalar potential. That means I can always write them as gradients of a function that I call the scalar potential. You know what, what this is? The gradient, right? Well, what is it? Is partial in, in all directions of this that is a scalar quantity. But again, uh, really, I don't want the scalar, the, the Cartesian coordinates. I want the, the QJ, right? The, 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 the generalized coordinates. So again, uh, 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 I have uh, this QJ, right? The QJ are what? are uh, the sum over i of the gradient with respect to i of, of, of your potential. But here I, I want to change from Cartesian to this generalized coordinate. So again, I get a partial derivative of your change of variable. So here i is sum, and I have a free j that is this j that you find here. Right? This is the, is it's the same trick I did many times the other time, the last lecture, that uh, if you change your, uh, your variables, you, mo you get this extra factor of the derivatives, right? And in fact, if you sum over i, what you get here is, is just the, the partial derivative of your potential with respect to qj, with the minus sign because of this. If you want, this is from linear algebra that uh, uh, if you have the gradient of this times this, uh, this is just a change of variables that here you have a d as a function of this q, and then you take partial derivatives with respect to the particularly generalized coordinate that you call q sub j. Okay, so this quantity, the qj, can be written in a very simple form if the force is conservative, right? A big if. As, uh, as we said last time, uh, many forces are not conservative. For instance, uh, frictional forces here on this, on this floor, they are nice because otherwise I, I won't be able to stop when you, right? Uh, in fact, I won't even be able to start. It's like if you are uh, on, a, on, a, on a frozen pond, right? There is no way, and uh, we will come back to this problem, right? There is no way, how do you move if you are on, on right? There is no way you can move because uh, there is no force working back. So if you do like this, you simply, uh, there is nothing you push. So you need, it's like in empty space, right? If you are an astronaut, even if you are just 10 centimeters from the spaceship, right? There is no way you can get back there. You die because you, there is nothing you can push and get there. In fact, how do they move there? They move by firing some uh, gas, right? Some, uh, they, they have gas guns that they fire, so the gas goes that way and the, and the astronaut goes the other way. And the same is what you do on, on the pond. You, you need a friend and then you push the friend and the friend moves in that direction and you move in the other direction. In fact, this is a very nice motion because the center of the mass remains exactly fixed in the same position, right? But the parts of the system can move. This is essentially how, how a rocket moves. How, how you go to the moon through this procedure. The center of the mass of the rocket stays exactly where it is, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, just uh, the two components, the, the gas pro projected out by the engines and the rocket move in the opposite directions, right? So the center of the mass stays uh, somewhere in Florida where the, sh the, the, the rocket is fired from, right? It just goes one way <laughs> this way, and the rocket goes to, to the moon, if you are lucky. And here's the same. You, you, you want 
forces that are conservatives uh, uh, and so uh, you are exactly in this situation and we, we essentially work mostly with forces that they indeed they are conservatives because they are simpler okay we, we will discuss a few examples that are not but in general uh, uh, you see the most important forces that we will discuss that is gravity uh, uh, essentially gravity uh, it is conservative but there are many important forces that are not uh, for, for instance the, the uh, part of the of the Lorentz force you know about Lorentz force the force uh, on a charge in, in the magnetic and electric field that uh, the magnetic part is not conservative we come back that next year when I, I'll teach you electromagnetism, hopefully. Um, okay, but uh, uh, today the only thing we want is to replace this Q, Q, QJ, right, by this term DV, DQJ. And then you see that that, that function that I introduced arbitrarily uh, 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 last week uh, that I call the Lagrangian, big L, I call uh, the Lagrangian to be T minus V, right? T minus V. So what, what can I, you see, this term is exactly the same, right? It's a partial derivative here of the kinetic term and here of the potential with respect to the generalized coordinate. So I can bring this inside if I put the minus and, uh, and that this term is, is right there. Okay. So here already I have the Lagrangian, so it's the equation I wrote uh, uh, for you. But how about here? Can I put a, a minus V so that I have a nice uh, uh, Lagrangian uh, in both terms? Well, yes, because the potential, by definition, depends only right on, on the generalized coordinates, not on the generalized velocity. Again, this is not always true. There are potential which depend uh, on the, and again, the electromagnetic field is an example of that, because remember that the Lorentz force, it depends on the position in the Coulomb potential. Do you remember the Lorentz force? It's something like this, right? If F is equal to the charge, then uh, say you have uh, the, the electric field here, but then you have a piece that goes like, like this, right, in some unit. And you see this part here that depends is the one proportional to the magnetic field does depend on the velocity. So there already you have an example of a force that depends on the velocity. So if ever you could derive this from a potential, that potential uh, it, it would depend on the velocity. But okay, let's bar this class. In general, this potential only depends uh, on, on your positions, exactly because it's conservative. And so I can safely bring the potential in here because each time you hit the potential with a partial derivative with respect to the generalized velocity, okay, it's zero. So again, I add zero to, to something and nothing is going to change. So I can, at this point, finally replace in this equation this L that I call the Lagrangian. from uh, Lagrange, Lagrange, um, who was again a mathematician at the, after the French Revolution at the time of Napoleon, and he, he worked out this. Uh, so I claim, I, I sort of derive for you, I walk you through the steps from Newton's law be written in this f sort of weird form that uh, we derive from uh, D'Alembert uh, down to this equation. And if you believe or if you, if you check the steps we went last time, it now you, 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 you should believe that uh, uh, this is completely equivalent to using Newton's law. But we, we gain something because you see now you only have to write the Lagrangian and the Lagrangian is just scalar quantity, kinetic energy and the potential energy, okay, no vectors in this. Uh, and then you simply crank in this equation and you end up with your equations of motion. And if you are lucky, these equations are 
one of the few types you know how to solve, and then you get uh, your trajectories, and then you supposedly you are happy, or at least you have solved the, 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 the problem. Okay? Questions? So let's see some, uh, well, unless the, is, is any questions? You are, oh, wait, now two. Okay, you go first. D, Y, B, yeah, okay. This is not a question, it's a, it's a comment. <laughs> no, no, it's Okay. Yeah, if the system has what? The force of state. So how to No, I didn't understand the, the, the word. The, uh, uh, an external force. A force exterior. Maybe in French. Uh, uh, French and Italian, Italian are very similar. So if you ask me in French. It's <laughs> no, the, the, the external force is the only force I have here. Because in doing this, derivation, I assume that the, the forces coming from the constraints, right, did not produce any work, right? And so they, they were eliminated. So uh, you forget about the, the constraints. That, that was one of the point in this exercise. I, wa I don't want to worry about the constraints, right? So this is taken care of by the fact that here you have only generalized coordinates. Remember, because, because you have generalized coordinates, the constraint is already built in, in the fact that here you have fewer independent coordinates than you started from. Right? So the const this, is, this is really the basic trick. You rewrite your system in terms of uh, independent variables. Uh, by independent, I mean I've used the constraint to reduce the number of my uh, of my coordinates, right? Like if, I, if you have two points uh, at the end of a road, right? In principle, I have how many degrees of freedom? Because I have two points. Each point, we said three, right? So, so in principle, I have three plus two, uh, times two because of two points, or so six. But because they are constrained to remain at the end of this road, I have fewer. Right, I have fewer because once I fix, look, look. If if you have one point here, in order to fix, I think this is a useful way to think uh, about degrees of freedom. Start counting how many coordinates you have to fix in order to completely fix your system. So one point, clearly three because it can go this way. So I, I need three coordinates. Let's say the three Cartesian coordinates, and then this is fixed. Then I have the other points. If the other point had been independent, I, I would need three more coordinates. But because I have this road, you see the points can only be on the surface of a sphere about the first point, right? So to fix the position of the second point, I need how many coordinates? Just two, right? Because it has to stay on this, on this sphere. It cannot move in this direction. So with two coordinates, I completely fix uh, the other point. So with five coordinates, I fixed uh, so my generalized coordinates are not going to be just the Cartesian coordinates of my two points. Are going to be some linear combination in such a way that are independent. For instance, I could use the Cartesian coordinates of the first point, but then just the angular position of the second point on this sphere. And this set of five coordinates are going to appear here. Five equations, five uh, uh, coordinates, OK? And the constraint has disappeared. I don't have to worry about the constraint. I worry about the constraint when I pick my generalized coordinates. But from that point on, as advertised, you can crank in this machinery and get the solution without thinking. I mean, without thinking about the original problem. Uh, is that clear or no? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but maybe it, it will become clearer as we <laughs> work out a few. So, so, uh, uh, so let's let's write some Lagrangians, right? And let's see if we. we
So let, let's have some, so, so what is the Lagrangian for a free point particle? Okay, let's start from uh, the, the kindergarten physics. So what is the potential of a free point particle? Uh, zero. Any other possibility? No, by definition it's free. So by definition V is equal to zero. And what is the kinetic energy for this? Uh, so let's say the, the particle has mass m. So it's just, uh, so uh, let's write it in, uh, in Cartesian coordinates. So you, you, you tell, so it's one half m times, yeah. So it depends on how many, so for instance, in this room, it's going to be x dot square plus y dot square plus z dot square. Very simple. And uh, how about uh, if I want to write the kinetic energy of a particle that is on the surface of this blackboard? So now it's a two-dimensional problem, right? Because I put the particle, you see. So how many degrees of freedom, first of all? Two. So let's write this. Uh, so this, the same particle, so you have this. And I have to write the, the kinetic energy of this particle, OK? Uh, of course, it, it, it is like this. If, if you write just the Cartesian coordinates, so I put a little system of coordinates on this blackboard, and then the kinetic. But I want to, this is not a good, uh, maybe it's not the best uh, system. Let, let's write it in polar coordinates. So we start switching from one set to the other. Uh, uh, how do you write this in polar coordinates? Actually, this is the, the, the general way you write your uh, Lagrangian it goes from Cartesian, you see, as, I, as we did it formally here, we went from Cartesian coordinates to a new set of generalized coordinates. So let's take now the example here that we go from Cartesian coordinates to a set of two generalized coordinates because we all agreed that the system had two degrees of freedom. So I have to write what, how I go from x and y to my generalized coordinates that I call, I don't know, I call them r and theta, right? So they are polar coordinates. So I guess I go from this system to this system here, in which this, this distance is r and this angle is theta, right? Perfect. It's a perfectly, I'm allowed to do this. And how do I go from this to that? Uh, so I get some. Uh, Trigonometry, right? So I, I, I write it because I know that you know this. So this is the change of is is, is the change of coordinates from, from my Cartesian to polar coordinate. And you see from here I can derive what is the my what what's what's my velocity that here I wrote in terms of Cartesian coordinates. What is it in term in term of polar coordinates, right? So let's do it. x dot is equal to, I have to dot this, so it's going to be r dot cosine theta. Then also theta, of course, is a function of time, right? As this point moves. So this is uh, minus, right, r sine theta, theta dot. Do you all agree or? I hope there are no, no questions about this. The same here, I have r dot. Now I take the derivative of this, uh, I'm sorry, sine theta, then derivative of this, so you have r cosine theta, theta dot. Now you have to take the square of this and sum. So what is the square of this? Uh, it's the square of this. So it's r dot square cosine square theta, first term. Then I, you square this, r square sine square, sine square theta, theta dot square. Then you have the, the cross product, OK? Minus 2 r dot r theta dot. Uh, 
cosine theta sine theta. Same story for the y. plus the double, the cross product, right? So I've taken the square of these two quantities. Now I have to sum them to get the kinetic energy. And you see nicely the cross product, they are kind enough to simplify. And you are left with this. Now, if you take this, so r dot square, r dot square, right? So you have r dot square times cos square plus sine square. That is equal to, to right. Plus this sum here. Again, you have r square, theta dot square plus this one. So that's very nice. It looked very complicated, but really boils down to a very simple expression. Now, this you should know by, by heart by the end of this class, because many problems that we will uh, try and solve uh, imply some uh, polar coordinates. So you don't want to have to go through this steps every time so you better so as you memorize this you should memorize this so anytime you see a point particle in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a problem with a with a spherical or, or, or circular symmetry you can write the kinetic energy immediately without having to 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 waste time How about something a little more? So this was a free, free meaning no potential particle. By the way, if you plug in this in here, you get uh, Newton's uh, equations, right? I hope by this stage you don't doubt that any longer, or you want to check. You want to check? No. Yes. Yes. What 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 don't you like? I add this and this. This. No. This. Yes. Uh, no, uh, uh. no, this is a plus b square that is equal to a square plus b square plus 2ab. I hope you, you are just pulling my legs, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Otherwise we have to start with the uh, arithmetic, <laughs> one or oh one. <laughs> OK, uh, let's just look at one, just for fun. Let's uh, take, uh, this is a free particles, right? So Newton's equation is going to be very simple, but just for the, f for, for the so let's take this. Uh, now, for, for, I don't know, t take this Lagrangian here. There is no potential, so I only have the kinetic energy. So I have to take the partial derivative. Let's take one. I have two generalized coordinates, right? So I have uh, x and y. Let's take x. So one equation is going to be partial derivative with respect to the x of this kinetic energy. So one half x dot square plus y dot square, right? This term minus again the I'm uh, sorry x dot the x of the same quantity. This must be equal to zero. Okay, it's trivial, but it's always nice to, to do trivial stuff. <laughs> so this term is the partial derivative with respect to x. 
that we all agree uh, uh, gives zero if there is no explicit x dependence here. In fact, there is no, because here you have x dot uh, that is not x. Uh, and e here you even have y dot that is certainly is not x. So this term drops out. However, here I do have uh, uh, a, a, an explicit dependence on x dot. Uh, and you see that I get uh, simply m x dot. And I still have a, a total derivative with respect to t. So indeed, this is Newton's law for a free particle of mass m in the x direction. Then uh, it's probably is not a surprise that you see it's completely symmetric. So if I take the other Lagrange equation that is the one with respect to y, I will get exactly the same. OK, I mean, I'm just discovering slice bread. So let, well, of course, uh, from a trivial input, you get a trivial output. But let's write a more uh, interesting Lagrangian. How about, so this was just a point particle. The simplest problem. Let's see, here I have, uh, ah, OK. Let's go back to this uh, strange contraption, the Atwood machine, right? We discussed this Atwood <coughs> machine last time. So let's take a simple example. Uh, so I have a, a pole here, and then two masses uh, that I call M1 and M2. You remember the Atwood machine, OK. Here it comes back. But now we, we, so, uh, we, we don't want to worry about tension, uh, the constraint, right? We, we have this new wonderful technique that is the Lagrangian. So let's just write the Lagrangian. First step, I have to count the number of degrees of freedom that is here. So I have two masses, but they are, they are constrained to move along these two directions, right? And all furthermore, they, they are constrained to, to have a fixed total distance. Let's call L the total length of that string, OK? So how many, how many uh, degrees of freedom? Let's take, a, let's take a poll. One, two, three, six. As I said, do you, in your mind the exercise of moving the system and fixing the position, right? So you start with one, let's start with this guy here. As I said, it, it has to move on this line. So, so if I start counting, for instance, I call x the distance from this to, to the position, OK? I call x this. So I fix x, uh, this guy. Can, can it move any further? No. Any doubt about this? I see, I don't see happy faces, so I stop. Do, do this exercise. I, I, you, you have to do that every time. OK, for every problem I, 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 I'll give you, you have to. It's the only moment in which you are supposed to think. Then you write the Lagrange, and then you crank in, and you get the answer. So it's the only moment in which you are required to think. So think. <coughs> you have two masses, but they have to move along this. So you take, start from one, right? It had three degrees of freedom as any little mass around the universe. But because I force the mass to lie on this line, it, it doesn't have three. Right, because uh, it cannot move this way or this way. It cannot move outside the, I mean, out from the blackboard. So unfortunately, this mass is not so free. It has only one degree of freedom because it can only move up and down this direction. So one. How about now? I fix this one. I fix it. I, I call it x, and x is some number that I given three, maybe. What what happened to the other mass? Where can it go? 
Again, it cannot go this direction because it, it not go this direction because I fixed those. In principle, it can move up and down like uh, the friend uh, on the other end, but unfortunately, he's linked to the friend by this length. So it cannot go anywhere because once I fix that, uh, this length here is going to be L minus X, right? This length from here to here, and this guy is, 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 has to remain there. So really, the system has only one degree of freedom. Do we all agree now? OK. So that's a nice situation in which uh, you have one degree of freedom. And it's quite natural to take this x as your generalized coordinate. And you are going to have how many Lagrange uh, equations? No? Why two? No, but the, the number of Lagrangian equations is the number of degrees of freedom. So one. Do we all? So, and what is now? Let's write the, the kinetic energy and then the potential. Uh, of course, when I talk about a mass, I'm assuming that there is gravity. So what is the kinetic energy of this system? I have just two point masses, right? And. Uh, Right, it's just one half, m1 plus m2, x dot square. Here you don't have to think. It's just uh, you, you have one coordinate. It describes the motion of both of them because as this goes down, this goes up, but you don't care. You see, that's the nice thing about using the kinetic energy because the kinetic energy is the same whether you go left or you go right. You see the advantage of not having to worry about vectors. So it's just the sum, the algebraical sum of the two. How about the potential? So these two masses are in the gravitational field. Let's call it uh, G, the acceleration uh, uh, because of, 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 of Earth, like in this room. So what is the potential energy? Well, let's take uh, this as a reference point, as, uh, as I already done by implying that the x is the distance from here to there. You know that in the, in the potential, uh, in the conservative potential, you can always arbitrarily add the subtract a constant, right? Because that doesn't change the force, because the force is the gradient of your potential. And any constant there is killed by the gradient. So you get the same force no matter what constant term you add or subtract. And so if you are smart, you can always add or subtract a constant term in such a way that your potential looks simpler. And this is just the fact that you start counting from whatever position, level, is convenient for you. OK? It's like if you go upstairs, the amount of work, uh, I mean, does not depend where you start counting uh, uh, at the zero level, right? I mean, you, you can always add the subtract a certain amount of constant force. So let's count in like this. Uh, so what is the potential for the first mass? is minus, why minus? Because usually, yeah, OK. And the other guy, well, I, are, I, I add this L. So again, it's this length here that I call L minus x because of the constraint. That, uh, so it's just m2g L minus x. So now you have your Lagrangian, because the Lagrangian, we said, is the kinetic energy minus the potential. Therefore, the Lagrangian is just, well, let's write it here, is 1 half m1 plus m2 plus, because minus times minus is plus. And I can get rid of this. And now, again, uh, as I said, once you have your Lagrangian, well, you just need the, to, to act with your uh, Lagrangian uh, equation, just one in this case, because uh, you only have one degree of freedom. So I, I, I have to compute dl 
with respect to the x, right? And then I need dl with respect to x dot. These are the two pieces of your equation. And then this piece has to be really taken with, the, with this. But let's first do the first step. What is dl dx, the partial derivative of your Lagrangian function with respect to x? So you have to look for x, not here, <coughs> but here, yes. So I get m1 g, and that's it because you take the derivative of this. And here you get the same, but with a minus m2 g. So m1 minus m2 uh, g. As you see, the constant terms doesn't change anything. I could have put here anything, and I would have had the same equation because it's simply killed by the gradient. How about the, the other term? Here I have to take the Lagrangian function, this partial derivative with respect to x naught. Now it's here. So this term here is just m1 plus m2 <coughs> x dot. But the Lagrangian equation is that d dt of this is equal to this, right? So I still have to take a, 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 a total derivative with respect to, ta to, the, ta to the time now these are constant, so the only thing that can change is the x, and I have my. So I I take these two together. My Lagrangian equation is that dt d dl dx dot minus dl dx must be equal to zero, right? This is the equation. So that means that I have uh, m1 plus m2 x dot dot minus this quantity m1 minus m2 g equal to 0. Or if I want to write it uh, a la Newton, I, I take x x dot, right? I take this on the other side. I divide by this. So I get minus m1 plus m2 g. And I've solved my, this is the equation of motion for the system. What happens if the two masses are exactly equal? Zero. That's interesting. Huh? Yeah. You see, if they are exactly zero, there is no acceleration. That's OK. It should be, right? There are two masses exactly equal. If one goes up, if the other goes down, there is no net acceleration. They are at equilibrium. Where you put them, there they stay. On the other hand, if one of the two is heavier, the system will slide down, right? This is the solution. And if the first one is heavier, it goes the other way. So it looks like this is a good solution. As I said, when you have uh, your equation or your solution, try the limiting cases just to see if it makes sense. <coughs> and this can be integrated in a very trivial manner, right? Because it's just, it's just saying the acceleration is this constant. So you, you get from the acceleration to the trajectory by integrating twice. So it's just like a free particle. It's going to be 1 half this constant t squared plus t, the whatever initial velocity you assign to the system, plus the initial position, right? And you have solved the problem. So I hope this, now go back, close your eyes, go back to the, the first time we solved something similar by using Newton's law. It, it was much more elaborate, I think. You see here, very little work. Once you have understood that the system has only one degree of freedom, the rest follows. If you just remember how to write the Lagrangian, kinetic terms minus potential, and then you crank in here, and you get your equation. And in this case, you are lucky. The equation is very simple. You can integrate it just uh, without much effort. Questions?
So now you are really getting excited about the Lagrangian because you see the possibility. Now, I mean, the world is yours. <laughs> Any problem I give you, you just crank in and you find the solution. Right? Why with Newtonian physics, you know, every time was a new world. Maybe I can solve it, maybe not. <laughs> if I'm clever, I found the correct vectors and I get the solutions. If I'm stupid, I will end up with the horrible differential equations that are not going to be able and I'll fail my final exam. But here, you know, that's all. So we will spend the rest of, most of the, of, of the rest of, of, the, uh, of this month uh, just applying this technique to more interesting problems that are not yet with machines. If you look at the, pro, uh, at the textbook, uh, this Goldstein textbook I, I, I told you, so if I, did you find it in the library? So if I give you the homework, I just give you the numbers of the problem in that book, and so you find it, right? So that I don't have to write the problem here. Yes, no. Yes. Maybe help your, each other if, if some of you have found the book. Huh? Yeah, I think it's the third edition, the one with Poole, uh, some other names. The first two editions, they only have Goldstein's name, right? The third edition is thicker with three authors, I think. So I, I give you the numbers on this most, most recent uh, edition. <coughs> so for next Monday, next Monday, hopefully, so now you, you, I, I told you how to write the Lagrangian. Yeah? So these problems are about some systems in which you are supposed to write the Lagrangian. Uh, and you have time to Monday. So the way this works is that on Monday I will ask you, some of you, to come out and solve the problem for the other. If this is okay with you. So that, uh, so maybe at this time I give you three problems, so three of you, you can agree, you can discuss it uh, among you or, or, or I'll call somebody if, if there are no volunteers. It's the usual things, right, in classes. <laughs> when everyone looks down, <laughs> hoping to become invisible. <laughs> but the point is that by the end of this uh, class, uh, each of you must have solved at least one problem at the black. So this is sort of a, a, a constant that I add to your final grade. Right? But uh, this is not a conservative system, so these constants make a difference. <laughs> if you don't have it, you, you change it. You don't take the gradient. Okay, so you go to chapter one, uh, and uh, uh, so I write here the homework. So this is homework number one, and just three problems. So problem num 19, 21, and 22 in chapter one. So you see, they are just problems, uh, some system, uh, more or less like this, and, and you just write the Lagrangian. And then you solve, you, you write the Lagrangian and derive the uh, Lagrange equations, okay? So look it up. Uh, if you have problems, tell me. Uh, if you don't find the problems or, or something, you, you tell me on Friday or just before. And then on Monday, Monday we discuss the solution. So let's uh, proceed. <coughs> I'll look if I have some other, yeah, maybe let's do another, another system. So this was the Atwood machine. Here's the Lagrangian. Let's discuss another, another example. This is a little more, more similar to what, uh, w uh, of what the, these three problems look, look like. So a little more. So I give you another system. And I draw, so now you have the, the usual point particle that I call uh, M1. But now I want to, to describe a little more complicated system just to to make the, the thing a little more interesting. So let's assume that this particle is uh, it's on, it's, it's constrained to, to stay on a road that is fixed to, to, to a side wall like this, OK? And m moreover, from this point hangs uh, a pendulum with a mass m2 here. Is that clear? So you, you have. Okay, let's turn it around. You have a pendulum 
with the mass m2, but the, 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 the pendulum is hanging from a point of mass m1, and these points can move along this line. Clear or not? Okay. So you see, this looks like an awfully complicated system, but we are not worried because we don't have to understand anything. We only have to count the degrees of freedom, write the Lagrangian, and we have the equations. You see the, the power of the things. So, okay, st let's start with the usual question. How many degrees of freedom? Let's see, well, you tell me. Let's, let's give, clearly one is this, right? This guy can only move this direction, so, so let's call this x, okay? And you say two because I guess you are thinking this guy here can only oscillate, so the other degree, the other degree of freedom is that. Uh, in fact, I think I call it phi, just to, it's a good idea to, to use the full Greek alphabet. Okay, that's correct, right? Two degrees of freedom because again, let's, let's just really, uh, this guy can only move this way, so if I give phi, this is completely uh, frozen in that position, then this guy can still translate the entire system left and right, so if I fix x, then this is fixed as well, and then everything is frozen like a picture. So with two coordinates, I, I have completely uh, stopped the system in some position, and so I have identified, and in fact, I, I, I have, uh, uh, I have, uh, um, well, okay. Now, how do I write the kinetic energy? Now, the kinetic energy of this guy, so P, first step, I have to write the kinetic energy for the system. Now, the kinetic energy for this uh, guy here, it's simple, right? Because it can only, it's a point ma mass, point particle. It can only move in one direction, so this I can write right away. It's just whatever that mass M1 is, x dot square. How about the, the, the kinetic energy of the pendulum? That's a little trickier, but my suggestion is, in these cases, the simplest think is to write the Cartesian coordinates of this and then write the Cartesian coordinate in terms of your generalized coordinates as we did before. So why I say this? Because this is, a, again, it's a sort of a shortcut. You don't have to worry much. Whatever this, the kinetic energy of this is always, let's call x1, x2 the Cartesian coordinates. The kinetic energy is always x1 dot square plus y1 dot square. This is always true. The question is what is x1 and uh, y1? But because you have identified this, uh, this, uh, this to, they must depend in a unique manner to <coughs> on the only coordinate that you know to be independent, right? And in fact, that's, that's the case because what is x1? The posi I'm sorry, it's really two because I call it so what is x2? x2 is the position, so here I put x and y. So this is the position, <coughs> sorry, oh, this choke it. <coughs> sorry. Uh, so what is x2? x2 is the position in the x direction of the, of the mass uh, m2, right? So how much is that? Well, it, it is x, right? plus this, this little distance here that I, so let, let, let me call L the length of the pendulum. So it's every time it's just X plus L, right, yes. And what is Y2? Y2 is the displacement in the, in the vertical direction Again, this is clearly given simply by L, the cosine. You see, this is nice, right? Because I, I get the kinetic energy is always this combination in Cartesian coordinates. 
The only question is how I go from Cartesian coordinate to generalized coordinate that in this case I know to be just the angle because I pick the angle to be my independent coordinates and I did well because it's a good idea. And you see now I can write this kinetic term that I have to add here because it's going to be m2 divided by 2 plus this, this the sum of these two squares. So I have to take the square of this. <coughs> That is just x squared plus 2xl sine 5 <coughs> plus, a, and this one is even simpler. So it's like uh, uh, ah, yeah, you are right, yes. Ah, in fact, I was too, too quick. <laughs> you are right. So let's do it. I have to take the dot, as they said, and then square. So this is the dot here. How about the dot here? You see, OK, let's do it here. It's x dot plus l is a constant, cos phi, phi dot. And here is just. okay with all of you so now I square and I write it here so m2 uh, I write it here so the square of this is x dot square plus l square cos square phi phi dot square plus the the cos product plus that that is a single term, so L square phi dot square sine square phi. This is the kinetic energy. Again, uh, trigonometry helps me here a little because if you look at these two, I have the usual thing that you get the same polar coordinates that uh, cos cos square phi plus sine square phi is 1, so I can really get rid of this term. And it's this. This one, however, it, it remains. Maybe I can write it this way. You have the sum of the two masses accelerating with the x dot, right? If you collect this term and this, plus the m2, because it's uh, at the end of this pendulum, it has an additional term that you write in this form. Maybe like this. How about the potential energy? What is the potential energy of this guy here? Zero. Why? It cannot move. Uh, yeah. It's like myself on this. Uh, I have zero potential energy. Unless the flow collapses. So this, this guy has zero, but this, this, this one, this mass, uh, the second mass, Actually, it has the usual uh, uh, potential energy of a pendulum. I'm, I'm free to pick the, the label I want. Usually, I write it like mgl, right? the cosine of phi. This is convenient. But again, you can only add the subtract some constants if the problem may suggest that the final equation become uh, simpler. So I have my kinetic energy potential. I can write the Lagrangian, right? It's written here. It's just the kinetic energy, that first uh, line, minus so plus mgl cosine phi. OK? And now I can write my, uh, uh, my Lagrangian, Lagrangian equation. How many Lagrangian equations I'm going to have here? Two, right. One for x and one for, for y, uh, for, for phi. So 
So So let's let's do it. Let's write the these two equations. So the first one is uh, le let's take uh, so d dt of my Lagrangian with respect to x dot uh, equal dl dx. Okay. So how much is this? So the Lagrangian is this minus this. I have to look for x dot. Uh, uh, so and it's right here. So the first term is, is very simple. It's just the m1 plus m2. And I can take the, the, the time derivative right away, so I have the usual acceleration there. How about the other term? I have to look for a dependence on, on, on x, right? Huh? But there is no x, right? That's right. So here is not really the end. But uh, okay, let's finish here. So this is, but as he pointed out, this is not correct because there is hidden here this. Uh, So really here I should stop for a second and get this plus <coughs> so M2 L next dot is gone, right? Phi dot cosine of phi. And now I have to take the, 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 the time derivative, so I hit it here, but now this two I have one term from here a one term here. So you see it becomes complicated. From the, I mean the final equation is not so simple because I have this extra term. So let, let me write it here. So that I have m1 plus m2 x double dot. Then I, I hit with the time derivative this term. So I get m2l that multiplies phi dot dot cosine phi, right? minus phi dot square sine phi equal to zero because there is no explicit dependence on x in this Lagrange. So you see the problem, I mean the system, is, well, but this is correct, right? It, it could, it, it, this could not have been the correct answer because you know that there is kinetic energy in this oscillation, right? And, and this is a sort of a center of a mass quote unquote energy that gives uh, this term but then there is some acceleration due to the phi coordinate and this is hidden here. How about the other equation? I, I also have the other equation in which I take phi dot d phi. I have to do the same uh, and again, I, I have two places where I get this, okay? So this term here, I have L square M2 uh, phi, right? And then I, I have another M2 L x dot cosine. Yes? Again, I, I, I take the time derivative, so this, here I get two dots, second derivative with respect to time, and here I get two terms, so let me write it here. M2 L2 phi dot dot plus, I have two terms, M, M2 L times X dot dot cosine phi minus x dot phi dot x phi. However, this is not equal to zero because now dl d phi, right, gets one contribution from here and uh, 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 unfortunately also from there. So there is an escalating complication <laughs> problem, right? So let's do it. 
So this is simple. It is minus, but remember the Lagrangian gets minus the potential, so it becomes a plus. But then it gets another minus because of the cosine. So minus uh, mgl sine phi. And then I have this term uh, here in the kinetic energy that is, uh, uh, so is, is, okay, it's minus because you get uh, M2L x dot phi dot sine phi. So these are the two Lagrangian equations from the problem. And you see already that this is not an equation these two, neither of them, well, they are coupled, first of all, and uh, you're not going to be, I mean, it's not, this is not one of those equations uh, that you know the answer right away. Of course, the first things you can try, well, let, let's just spend two, two seconds on this, also because, uh, in fact, this is the, the, the equation, say you fix x, then the system should collapse down to the usual pendulum, right? Let's see if this is true. So I fix x. So x uh, is just a constant. So this, this term goes away, right? And similarly, this goes away, this goes away. So what do I have? This goes away. So let's look at the second, at this equation. I get m2l square phi dot dot. Now, this is not there. This is not there because I have x dot, right? This is there, and this is not there because of that. So I get this equal minus mgl sine phi. Uh, this is the m2 all along, huh? So you see, indeed, this is the equation for the pendulum that you, might, you should be able to recognize. And even this one, even this equation, you don't know how to solve it, I assume. Because you have a sign here, and this leads to a rather complicated integral. In fact, this is the starting point. If we have time, maybe we will discuss this. This is the starting point for the entire branch of mathematics that is called the, I don't know if you have done this in, in the Narayan class, uh, uh, the elliptic integrals. Have you, elliptic function? No? Okay. But anyway, uh, by if you want to study this equation, you need those, those elliptic integrals. And where do you find those integrals? You know that there is this book with all the special functions have you ever seen this book? Have you, otherwise, I, I urge you to go to the library and look for this book. It, it, there is just one book, essentially, because it was two Russian guys, Ritvik, Ritvik and... Uh, no, no, that's another one. Uh, okay, I guess there are two <laughs> books. I usually, I use the other one. That, uh, okay, I look up the reference, but a table of integrals and series. They are where you go if you want to, to solve this kind of problems. There they have mapped all the special functions, all the special functions you, you, you can, uh, I mean, all these special functions come from problems like this. I mean, they are special because they arise first in some mathematical problem that came from, from a problem, from a physical problem, right? Also trigonometric functions are special functions. It's just that you are so used to them that you think of them as uh, elementary functions, but they are not that elementary. Can you compute the sine of phi for any value? I mean, I know that you plug your pocket computer or something, you get the number, but how does the computer compute the sine? Huh? Right, did you hear? Series, you need the Taylor expansion. And what is the Taylor expansion? Just a polynomial expansion of your function because the only thing we know how to compute are polynomials. It's sad, but that's <laughs> what it is. The human brain can only compute polynomials. You, you only know how to do two plus two or two times two times two <laughs> and so on, right? So 
Taylor gave us this incredible gift that uh, any function about some point can be expanded in polynomials and then you know how to compute it. And that's what the computer does. Maybe it's not using Taylor expansion, it's using some better expansion, meaning that it converge, uh, an expansion that converges faster, but still is just a polynomial at the end of the day. All these polynomials have been grouped in special functions be that the sign of, of phi, very simple expansion of, you know, of the even powers of or, or the, the sign of the odd power. But uh, you have, uh, uh, what special functions do you know? Right, that's another special function that comes from, uh, you know, from a, a certain kind of differential equation. That's the way they discover. They discover the equation, they study the, the solution, they noticed that these equations was popping out in many different problems, so they gave a name. And they call it the hypergeometric or something. And here's the same. The solution of this is another function that comes out very often, and so they gave it a name that is elliptic function. They are very nice. If we have time, we I like to discuss them because they are a sort of generalization of the trigonometric function. Uh, uh, they have the nice feature that they are you know, the trigonometric function is periodic in one dimension, and the elliptic function, they are periodic in the complex plane. So that's very please, pleasant. Uh, if, if you like mathematics, they are nice, but okay, it's not essential. Anyway, just, <coughs> so this looks like a, a, a embedded in, in our system. You do have what you expect from the fact that if I, f if I freeze, one of the coordinates, I get back my pendulum. And just to, to, to say, usually you solve this problem for small oscillations, meaning by small that phi is sufficiently small. And again, thanks to Mr. Taylor, you can replace here phi. And so this problem, uh, you see, becomes very simple because it becomes this differential equation. Well, let's bring it on the other side, g right divided by L phi equal to zero. And this is a differential equation that you do know, I hope, how to solve. Because in fact, this is the definition of the sine and the cosine function. This, in fact, is the best definition of sine and cosine. I don't know how, how si the function sine and cosine were first introduced to you, but I think the best way is to first introduce the differential equations and then define the sine and the cosine as the solution of this differential equation. The same is true for the exponential function. What is the exponential function? Well, it's that function, the derivative of which is equal to the function, right? So you introduce the differential equation, and that gives you the, the exponential. That's the nice. Uh. OK, so we, we feel, we feel a sh uh, confident now that this was uh, probably okay because we, we, we discovered inside our problem that looked very complicated, the more familiar uh, uh, usual uh, oscillator, harmonic oscillator or pendulum problem that uh, we knew from our early days, okay? Of course, the full problem, I can try to simplify now the full problem by the same token. I said if I consider a small oscillation, Right? Then I can simplify all the sign. Be all the signs become phi, and the, cos <coughs> the cosine of phi becomes just one. So I can try and simplify, but still, you see, the problem is, is rather complicated because you have uh, velocity dependence and, and, and cross terms. So, I mean, this uh, looked like a not so complicated problem, but uh, if you really want to find the trajectories, you have your, uh, well, you have to massage that system uh, sufficiently, but we are not going to do that. Uh, I mean, this, the problem here was just to write the Lagrangian, uh, not to solve the, the problem, okay? So before I stop, I want to introduce the next, uh, uh, <coughs> the next uh, uh, thing I want to discuss, uh, and I'll finish tomorrow. Uh, uh, 
So let, let me, uh, you have any questions or comments? So do you like this Lagrangian thing? Or I hope so, because that's what we are going to do for the next weeks. So before we really start with some uh, uh, more interesting problems and solve them by, by means of this approach, let me just, I want to rederive the same equations in a different way. In, in physics, uh, it's always a good idea to derive the same things in different ways. In fact, this is part of what we, you remember what I said the first day, that you have to develop some physical insight. And this you do by solving many, many exercises. But also by getting the same equations from different point of views. Because you know, if, if you have different uh, uh, approaches to the same set of equations, then you are in a better position to solve or to apply those equations in different situations. And this is the, what we call physical insight. So I start, well, I see I, I, I don't have much time, but let me just uh, start the, 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 the w just state what I want to do, and then we do it uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. So this is a, a completely different, you see, up to now, we, we have discussed differential equations, right? And uh, differential equations are th that things that uh, if you tell or if you have uh, uh, your system, and your, the velocities of your system at one point, they tells you how it, it goes next point. And from there to the next point. And from there to the next point. This is the, the way a differential equation describes the motion, right? Because it's a differential equation. It, it just incre a small increment of the motion of your system by an infinitesimal amount of time. From one point in time, one at a time. So you look at the trajectories as it develops in time from one time to the next, to the next, to the next, and this you follow the motions, okay? I, I already mentioned this is not the most natural way to describe the motion. Again, you have a chalk, you throw it. If you don't know anything about differential equations, you would like to describe this motion as the trajectory, you know? I, I, throw, I toss this chalk, and it moves like, uh, my, you know that is a parabola, but. Uh, Forget it, just uh, like a trajectory like this. I don't have this idea that uh, I describe the motion by a vector in time that moves this way. This was, as I said, the, the, the idea of motion that uh, they had before Newton or Galilei. I don't know who was the first one. Anyway, before the uh, 1600s. And you see, the problem with this idea is perfectly fine, and we are going to use this idea to rederive Lagrange equation uh, tomorrow. But uh, the problem with this idea is that the mathematics that you need in order to develop this idea is more complicated than usual differential equations. And that's what uh, people for 2,000 years were stuck with. They had this nice idea that bodies were moving along trajectory as a whole, so that if you toss something on the beach, it will move like that trajectory. But that was all. They, 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 they couldn't write an e equation, the solution of which would describe this motion. So OK, it was nice. You, you could say, well, this moves like that, that drops like that. But that's not how science developed. They were not able to produce a quantitative uh, predictions about the motion, right? If you solve the differential equation, I give you the mass of this object and the initial velocity, then you know how it moves. In fact, you don't even need the mass because as we discussed, it does not depend, the trajectory does not depend on the mass of the object. <laughs> so they had this, uh, I mean, people had this idea that motion was uh, following some trajectory in space but they didn't know what to do with that because they didn't have that branch of mathematics that is called, I don't know, with different names, but uh, uh, calculus of variation, maybe this is how, uh, that was developed only in 1800s. Uh, 
two, two centuries ago, yeah, two centuries, 200 years ago. Because you see, you understand that this is a more complicated problem because you have to, so let's say <coughs> you have a, uh, at time t, one, you have your body here. Let's just take a point particle, but you will see it nicely generalized to more complicated uh, systems because all you have to think is instead of uh, a, 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 a space with uh, three dimensions, you only need to think of a space with the number of dimensions equal to the number of generalized coordinates. Think of the power of this idea. If you have a point particle, you have three coordinates in three dimensional space. Okay. If you have a more complicated object, right, maybe with six degrees of freedom, can still be thought as a point in a six dimensional space. Because in a six dimensional space, that point that now is an object is still specified by six coordinates. So if you increase the number of dimension of your space, you can think of your body no matter how complicated it is, by a point in a more complicated space. So you think, okay, I mean, I'm making my actual my life even more complicated because I have a simple object but in a more complicated space. True, but still a powerful idea that we ex will exploit. But let's say with a simple point at time t, and as I said, it moves to a point, uh, to another point in space at time t2, and this is the trajectory. And you see the problem here. If you have the differential equation point of view, you just divide this is more, right? And each of these is the trajectory that maybe in space, three-dimensional space is identified by this uh, coordinate. And then you solve the differential equations as the body moves. On the other hand, if you want to think of this trajectory as a single whole curve, you don't know exactly what to do. You have to vary the curve, right, and study how by varying the curve some constant, some quantity changes, and then write an, an equation for this change. Because presumably, if you introduce the correct principle that we will do tomorrow, you will find that among all, th so this pa point can go from time one to time at time two, from here to there, in many possible ways, right? Even very crazy. But what happens is that uh, if you try for that given system, it goes in a single way. So why that way? Why that trajectory? Why if I touch this, it goes down like this? It doesn't go up and then down. You see, it's the same problem, but in a different way. And this is really how people think. A kid would think like this, I guess. So why? Out of all these possible trajectories, the body follows a single one. If I'm able to translate this problem in mathematical terms, then I will be able to rederive Lagrange equations, because at the end, I still have to obey Lagrangian equation in a different manner. And this is what we will do tomorrow. I will introduce a principle that says that the true trajectory is, well, I'll leave that to <laughs> as a suspense for tomorrow. And by applying this, I will rederive Lagrange equations. But you see that the problem here is that I have to, why this, the mathematics here is not the usual differential equations, is the calculus of variation, because I have to compute some quantity along this path and study how this quantity varies as I vary the path. This is a sort of next order in complication from the other problem that was just how the quantity vary as a vary time. So that's what we do. Okay.